Okay, I'm going to talk about the ways in which um, psychiatric imprisonment and forced drugging are illegal in practice uh, in, and electroshock in the United States uh, under existing, existing law. The three areas that I'm going to talk about are violations of procedural due process, violations of substantive due process, and the right to effective counsel. Um, okay, so the due process clause is very simple. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, there are two, two aspects. Procedural due process is you have the right to notice, uh, you know, to be told what it is in essence that you're being charged with. And, and, enough, and the right to be, then to, the right to be heard, which means the right not only to present your case in a, in a meaningful manner, and that means notice in a meaningful manner, and the right to present your case in a meaningful manner before a neutral decision maker. Okay, and that's what's called procedural due process. So now substantive due process, and I'm just going to talk about fundamental rights. If the government wants to take, deprive you of what's called a fundamental right, they've got to show a compelling state interest. There's got to be a really good reason why they're going to take that right away from you. Um, and, they, and it's also got to be the least restrictive or least intrusive alternative. They can't overdo their reaction, you know, whatever it is that they're, whatever reason it is that they're taking this action, they, they can't uh, come down with more force than is necessary to achieve the goals, okay? Now, if it's not a fundamental right, then they don't, they don't have to go that far. They, they I don't know if it, you know, they may just have to have what's called a rational basis, some connection between what they want to do and the means they choose to achieve it. But so it's fundamental right. It's got to be a compelling state interest, and they've got to do it in the you know the least forceful way. Now, in these two cases, Addington versus Texas, the U.S. Supreme Court said that that putting someone the involuntary commitment is a deprivation of a fundamental right. Okay. They, they call it, a, you know, a massive deprivation of liberty, is what they call it. And then, um, in Washington versus Harper, they kind of, they kind of assume involuntary drugging was, forced <coughs> drugging was, uh, deprived someone of a fundamental right. Okay. So what are the compelling state interests? What are the reasons why the state might have the right to lock someone up and drug them? Well, one is what's called... Uh, parents patri, which stands for basically being a substitute parent, that someone is incompetent, you know, is childlike, and therefore, you know, we need to take care of you. We're from the government, we're here to help you, kind of thing. Um, and anyway, that, as I kind of said earlier today, that those determinations really are quite bogus. And the, the CRPD, the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, really does away with that whole idea. Uh, and it's a uh, breathtaking and groundbreaking uh, concept for uh, to be, you know, really uh, adopted by the United Nations. Um, but in any event, in the U.S., they say, you know, if you are, you know, incompetent, then we'll allow the government to make these sorts of decisions for you. And we have the same kind of problems with guardianships. I mean, um, that's uh, used a lot of times to. to especially uh, forced drug and forced electroshock people. Okay, the other uh, source of, of power is what's called the police power, which is basically protection. That's the idea of, you know, preventing harm. Uh, and that's basically the idea for, well, locking someone up, psychiatric imprisonment or involuntary commitment is kind of a euphemism for it, theoretically has both uh, ideas that you lock someone up to protect, you know, society, but also you lock someone up to, you know, because they're so crazy they don't know they should be locked up, um, or they should be in the hospital. Okay, um, and, and these concepts are, I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, okay, now there's this case, United States versus Cell. Now that was a case 
to uh, drug someone to make them competent to stand trial. Okay, and the Supreme and they would just do this regularly. And the Supreme Court said these things. Um, the important governmental interests are at stake. Well, that sounds like what we talked about. So you know, a fun, for a fundamental right, it will significantly further those state interests. Substantially unlikely to have side effects that will interfere significantly with achieving the state interest. In other words, it's got to work. Okay, um, and it's got to be necessary to further those interests. The court must find that any alternative, less intrusive treatments are unlikely to achieve substantially the same results. So that sounds, you know, like a fundamental rights uh, deprivation analysis, um, and that's medic medically appropriate. In other words, in the person's best medical interest in light of his medical condition, the specific kinds of drugs at issue may matter here as elsewhere. Different kinds of antipsychotic drugs may produce different side effects and enjoy different levels of success. So the government really has to come in and improve, and this is all theoretical, but it has to prove these things. Okay, now I want to talk just a little bit. Okay, now in a, in a competence to stand trial case, what's the governmental interest? In doing. They've got an interest in bringing criminals to justice and for public order and all that kind of thing. That's the governmental interest. But in this case, the, the, he was a dentist and he was accused of Medicaid fraud. So. And yes, yeah, so. And so there was a real question about whether or not this kind of, you know, really heavy-duty um, uh, use, basically of force. I mean, it's an assault on the body. Uh, you know, whether the governmental interest in accusing, you know, convicting a dentist of Medicaid fraud really warranted this kind of uh, intrusion and uh, deprivation of his rights. So, but they never really decided that question here because they sent it back to the uh, lower court, I think. Maybe they decided it didn't. Um, so, I, I'm mainly talking about in the civil case, you know, when in forced drugging. Uh, basically, just because <coughs> supposedly it's good for you, uh, but anyway, this is the U.S. Supreme Court decision that comes, you know, really closest to that, and I think it really does also say that it's a fundamental right, and and it, it really is a fundamental rights uh, analysis. Okay, so but but here's the here's the thing. This is really kind of the crux of this: is that in truth, they can never prove it's in someone's best interest to force them. The Supreme Court said that you had to prove that the right to lock someone up by what's called clear and convincing evidence. Okay, and there's like three levels of proof. In a normal civil case, like a contract case, it's preponderance of the evidence. So whoever is over 50% uh, wins. Uh, and then in the criminal context, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, which is, you know, really hard. It's supposed to be really, you know, you can't have any. Well, reasonable doubt, um, and before you can convict someone. But here they said, well, we're not going to require reason reasonable doubt. And one of the things they said is basically psychi psychiatry was such an inexact uh, science they could never really prove it. You know, which you know in itself I think you know raises some questions That's about the, the whole the whole idea. Um, but they said, but they said, but it needs to be more than a preponderance of the evidence and. and clear and convincing, and there are different formulations for that. One is that has to be highly probable. Okay, so, and in the Myers case, the Alaska Supreme Court said you have to prove that the forced drugging is in the, pers the person's best interest, and there are no less intrusive alternatives, uh, by clear and convincing evidence, too. So, the point is that if, if the, the, the both sides of the issue on forced drugging, okay, is, and electroshock. I'm not going to talk much about electroshock, but, you know, I mean, electroshock is equally, if not, you know, more clearly not helpful and harmful. Um, but in, in truth, they cannot prove that the forced drugging is in the, pers the person's best interest by clear and convincing evidence. And probably not by a preponderance of the evidence either. I mean, but the pro and I'll talk about this a little later. The problem is that that evidence never really gets presented to the judges. Okay, and a less intrusive alternative is almost always feasible, always available. You know, you could do something less intrusive than drugging someone, right? 
mean, you could. But are you talking about in terms of restoring somebody to competency? No, I'm talking about general civil commitment. I mean, okay. the drugs don't really restore people to competency. But the court uses it that way. Right. Well, what happens in, in uh, what they really do, okay, to be competent to stand trial, and Tina may know this better than me, because I'm not a criminal lawyer, but neither is he. But, um, you, you, in order to be competent to stand trial, you have to under, be able to understand the nature of the charges against you and the ability and the ability to assist counsel in your defense. Okay, but what it's really used for is to, you know, put someone in a stupor so they don't create a disturbance in the courtroom. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, but I don't. I've never even heard of any studies that talk about drugs restoring people to competence. So, if you're not competent to stand trial, then they have to let you go. I mean, they may be able to commit you civilly, so they don't really want to do that. So they, they come up with all these uh, legal re you know, justifications, and then they don't meet them in fact. Okay. Um, but then again, for a less intrusive alternative, you, you almost always can find a less intrusive alternative than drugging or shopping someone against their will. I mean, there always is an alternative. The alternative is to not drug them yeah. again and, and just you know, <laughs> see, 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 Thank you. support them to be who they are and see what happens. Right, right. Watch and wait is even the medical way of saying that. Right. And, um, but, right. I, I think that's basically true. And there's also the issue of, well, what is the, you know, the state interest that they're trying to achieve and da da da. And that may not be with that. But I think that they're, in essence, that's, I mean, you would go there always is, and you would take out the almost, and I'm, I'm pretty close to that. Okay, so, but the point is, is that in truth, they can't, they can't really meet the legal criteria for forced drugging. So, that's how forced drugging and forced electroshock is illegal in practice. Okay? They just don't meet the constitutional requirements that uh, would give them the legal right to do that. And the problem, of course, is that uh, people's rights are not honored. That's under what's called the parents' patriae uh, justification. You know, we're here from the government. We're here to help you. We're going to be your parent because you're, um, you know, you're incompetent. But now then, you've got this police power of forced drugging, which is usually called emergency forced drugging. Um, and it, I'm familiar with in Alaska where you've got in the statute says serious physical harm or death is imminent. I mean, is the justification. And then they can only do it for 48 hours. And they can only do that for three times before getting a court order. And it's just ignored. I mean, I took a deposition of a psychiatrist. She had no idea that, about the illegalities. And they, you know, they do forced drugging if the person's agitated. They'll say, agitated, you know, shoot them up with how about, right? Well, agitation, so what? So, you know, you know, I mean, of course, they usually have good reason to be agitated. But, um, but as a constitutional legal matter, that's not a sufficient justification for drugging someone. Um, yelling, even less so. <laughs> right? I got, I got forced drug for yelling. Posthumously. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, yeah. Okay, and then there's usually a less restrictive intrusive alternative also in that too, and people say you could always decide not to do it. But, um, they're, I always forget what they're called now. Uh, it was, used to be called Meta Services in Phoenix. They had this program where they put a pier and, and a couch in the admitting room of the, the psych, you know, where they brought people in the hospital. I don't know if it was a psych ER. And they brought the um, rate of seclu seclusion and restraint to basically zero. And these were, you know, these were people that were handcuffed and hauled in. You know, and that in itself would, you know, really cause people to be upset. Um, so, you know, that I think is an example of a less intrusive uh, or less restrictive idea. Um, and then one of the things that, you know, and I kind of have this as a question maybe can answer. I can't take a lot of time on it, but is seclusion a less restrictive or less intrusive alternative than force than Shooting someone up with how about? You mean I isolation? Like yeah. When I was in psych units, uh, they take me and throw me in a, what they call a quiet room. The quiet room? Yeah. With no toilet, no, no, no class no, no. Was that more beneficial than you? Well, no, no. Was it, is it less restrictive? Is it less intrusive? Right. Well, I 
are you restraining the person too? Or just well, there's different, I've got two different things. I've got restraints. Is seclusion less restrictive or an intrusive than for, than a shot of how I think it is less intrusive, yeah. Because Depends on how long. Yeah. Okay. Well, and and clearly not having a toilet too. and stuff, but that's just, just that, inhumane. We, we know, you know, we, we know psychologically that if you are isolated past a certain period of time, that, that can, the psychosis sets right. in right. just right. from right. that. Right. Right. Just okay, and then Intrigue. how about restraint? Is, you yeah, know, is, is restraint a less restrictive alternative than drugging? Yes. I would say yes. Okay, well, well here's my take on it. Here, here, okay, here's my take on it. Why don't you ask the person? Okay, you say, look it, you've got, you know, here's what you're doing, and it's, you know, we just can't have it. Um, we, you know, we're either going to have to shoot you up with Haldol, or you can go to the quiet room, or, you know, you can have, or we can, you know, put, you know restrain you. But that okay. also... That's not receptive, though. That's like Sophie's choice. Well, I know, but here's... No, no, I agree. I agree. But here, my, one of the... I have this... There, it is, but it also, I think, is a little bit empowering. I mean, it's not much of a choice. But I also think... I have this theory. I've never tested it out. That if you give someone that choice, that it really might calm them down. Yeah, yeah. It's so respectful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in some of those situations, if someone's given a choice just to be strapped to the bed... Some people might opt for that option because they don't want to be medicated. Right. Um, I think that's true. Given my experience with working on the inpatient. Yeah. When this is a case, Cooper versus Oklahoma, and, uh, well, Kansas versus Crane, I mean, and then there's another one later. Um, <coughs> where the U.S. Supreme Court said when involuntary commitment was constitutionally permissible. <coughs> okay, and the, all of these are important. First, the confinement takes place pursuant to proper procedures and evidentiary standards. So that's what I'm talking about, you know, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but, um, you know, where they don't, you don't give notice. There's this uh, forced electroshock case where, in New York, where the uh, mental hygiene lawyer, um, uh, was actually one of the few good ones. Um, was it Kim Darrow? I think it was. The, the, the judge wouldn't let him cross-examine the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, I know all about electroshock. I don't need to hear this. Okay. And, it, and, that, and they appealed that. Good for them. And then, but then they lost on appeal. I mean, it was really outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's, that's one of the things. I'm going to talk about other specific examples later. Um, okay, and then th this is when it's Involuntary commitment is permissible, okay? A finding of dangerousness either to oneself or to others, okay? And that, that dangerousness is coupled with some additional proof of su such, some additional factors such as a mental illness or mental abnormality, okay? That's, um, the that's what the U.S. Supreme Court has said is constitutional. Um, and then in this case called Kansas versus Crane, the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, if someone is so <laughs> dysfunctional, disabled uh, by their, you know, mental illness, that they're incapable of surviving safely in freedom, that's also a form, a sufficient form of harm to self to justify being locked up. Okay, so that's the U.S. Constitution. Okay, now, it's so huh? It's so vague. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, it, it, yes, it is vague, and they do tend to be. But you know, when you talk about surviving. You know, you're talking about, you know, dying, basically. Okay, survive means not to die, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, that's what I would say. Okay, now I'm going to, in the last, they actually used three different formulations with the Alaska Supreme Court picked up. So I'll talk about the three different kind of variations on survive that they used. Okay, so now let's look at one of the things that really gets me. Uh, in Alaska, we call them ex parte applications where any adult can uh, file a petition to have someone hauled in and evaluated. And there's, in all the states, there's some kind of uh, summary way in which to do that, okay? Well, I, you know, where's, where's the procedural due process? Where's the notice? Where's the opportunity to be heard? Okay, it's not there, okay? Now, there are certain circumstances in which you can dispense with notice and opportunity to be heard. And the classic example 
I think, is a search warrant. Whereas if you told someone, we want to search your car for drugs, uh, come to, you know, and we're going to give you notice of that, and you can tell the judge why we shouldn't, you know, in the meantime, if there were drugs in the car, they would disappear, right? Okay, so that's, that's a reasonable justification. But even in that case, you, the, the police have to go to the judge, and theoretically, but even more than theoretically, and they have to present you know, sufficient evidence to give probable cause to, to do that. Okay. Well, here, they don't do that. I mean, the, the statute does. In Alaska, the statute actually is pretty good. Um, but they don't follow it. Um, so we think that routine use of these kind of procedures is unconstitutional. Now, I think there might be some theoretical situations where ex parte uh, order to pick someone up would be constitutionally permissible. Um, but you'd have to show that there, you know, there's such imminent harm uh, that's so likely that to justify it. And the judges would have to, um, you know, really look at that. The statute in Alaska says, I'm not sure I have a slide on it, says that when someone files a petition, the judge has to conduct or order a, an investigation to then see if there's justification to bring the person in. And then, then if there is, the court may issue an order ex parte. Well, that's just all ignored. They just, if someone files a pe petition, they basically sign rubber stamp, you know, they just sign the order to bring the person in. And so they don't follow the statute. Um, but I think more fundamentally that they have to show that there's some emergency, or what's legally we call it an exigency, that justifies dispensing with notice and an opportunity to be, to be heard. Because you know, and one of the, second, uh, I'm making a big stink about this in Alaska, but one of my points is that doing this to people is really counterproductive. I mean, if, if you can think of a better way to get someone agitated, or if someone's, you know, that say, thinks that people are out to get them, you know, you just <laughs> proved it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I say should happen is you should, you know, you, I think it's okay to go and visit the person and say, Look, at, we're concerned about you know these things. We're concerned yeah. about you. What can we do to help? You know, and ask the person. You know, what do you need? We need you a know, peer. That's person. that's you know. I mean, this the idea of doing this is so foreign to you know the psychiatric profession. I mean, you know, every time I suggest that maybe the person <laughs> ought to be asked what they want, it's like oh, you know, they never even think of that because the person's crazy. Of course we're not going to ask what they want. <laughs> well, it's hard to improve in the Western Lapland but by going to where the individual is. Most times it de-escalates the, the situation from the start, right? And working right. as a homeless outreach worker and being a psychiatric survivor a lot of times, that's what we did was go to that person in their environment and half the time, <coughs> the majority of the time, we left without them, right? So. Yeah, well, I'm a big believer in, you know, peer support or, you know, peer workers or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think that that's proven to me. It's an evidence-based practice, officially recognized as an evidence-based practice by the SAMHSA, of the, you know, the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So I'm a big believer in that. But, but that's the idea is that, yeah, I mean, let's not go and do something that escalates the problem. Let's find out, you know, try and help the person. And you, right, and it's way better. People can stay in their home if they want to. Um, and God forbid we ask them what they want. Um, okay, then let's talk about this, this point that you can only lock someone up if you prove by clear and convincing evidence that the person is dangerous. Okay? Well, all the studies show, and I'm going to read this from Michael Perlin's treatise, the voluminous literature as to the ability of psychiatrists or other mental health professionals to, rely, to testify reliably as to an individual's dangerousness in the indeterminate future had, okay, this is had, so let, let me talk about it, been virtually unanimous. Psychiatrists have absolutely no expertise in predicting dangerous behavior. Indeed, they may be less accurate predictors than laymen and that they usually err by over-predicting violence. Okay, that's, that's not a surprise, I think, to anyone here, okay? Um, Okay, Vince? Yeah, they, they, they use that in their uh, uh, forensic mm -hmm. court uh, briefs. 
all the time. But when they de when a uh, psychiatrist gets into trouble for yeah. release, something, something uh, terrible yeah. happens. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, I so, found it. so, but as right, and as yeah. a legal matter, okay, this. Well, let me go to the next slide. Okay, now then, as a result of that, there were a lot of studies that were actually done and and programs instituted to try and get better predictions. Okay, and the best they've gotten to is if they go through these instruments, you know, they can get to 50% of re uh, reliability. Well, that's not clear and convincing. You don't get to lock people up on a coin, coin toss. Okay, then, okay, so my thesis is at most 10% of the people that get locked up get involuntarily committed, meet, actually meet the legal criteria. At most, it's 10%, okay? So you've got this predictions of violence not being uh, reliable, and then you've got this issue of being gravely disabled that, or a similar concept, that that's legal only if the person is, quote, unable to survive safely in freedom. Um, now, I haven't really seen any studies on that, um, so I don't know. Um, and we challenged the uh, this gravely disabled statute in Alaska. There's an a, there are two prongs. Well, the apron says that if we don't lock them up, serious accident, illness, or death is highly probable. Okay, and I go, well, I think that meets constitutional requirements. But the second prong, as I mentioned, was that if it's substantial deterioration of the person's previous ability to function independently will deteriorate. Okay, well, uh, deteriorate, deteriorate. Um, anyway, we said, hey, wait a minute, you can't lock someone up for that. And the Supreme Court agreed. And then they said, but they, they phrased it in three different ways, and I don't know why they do this. I mean, they ought to just use this, you know, the same words that, you know. So the first one, and the one that they say at the beginning and end, that that's basically their decision, they say, unable to survive safely in freedom. And then they also said, is unable to live safely outside of a controlled environment. Okay, well, live, again, also kind of seems like, well, right, does that mean live or die? But it kind of has a suggestion of meaning maybe it doesn't have to be that extreme. Um, but then the other one, they say, cannot exist safely outside of an institutional framework. And exist is kind of like live or die. But the point, so you don't really know exactly what that means. And, and um, one of the unfortunate things about the Alaska Supreme Court is what they've done is they they will decide these issues, but they'll say that the actual issue is moot. But you know, we're not going to decide whether they actually proved it because that's moot. Uh, in other words, it's way beyond the time that that's really relevant. So we're not going to be deciding it. You know, it's not going to actually mean anything for uh, this case. Um, so we're not going to decide it. Um, so that's in a, in a, to be a pr problem. There's a recent case, uh, I think it's called Tracy B, that I actually didn't take the public defenders in Alaska. Finally, started taking a couple cases uh, in Alaska, but um, uh, where you know the the doctor testified, well, if we let her out, she's just going to come back, and he said that was enough. You know, so I thought that was pretty good. Okay, um, okay, so that's those two uh, force drugging. You know, procedural due process, substitute due process on um, involuntary commitment and forced drugging and electroshock. Okay, now I want to switch gears and talk about the right to effective representation because, in my view, this is where the legal system is totally broken. It's most broken. Is that the lawyers basically throw the cases, and many many times, at best, just you know, lay down and don't really put up any kind of real defense. And I'd say well over 99% of the cases. So that's my experience. If people think they've got, you know, that the lawyers in their area really do a good job, raise your hand. Nope. No, I, I, I observed just half a day of this, and I saw a few lawyers, and I'd say half of them uh, looked like they were good little fighters, and half of them looked How many smarts. presented their own witnesses? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, okay. they, they, but the, but in, in all cases, the, uh, shall we say, the defendant uh, um, got to speak. Okay, well, 
one, th one thing, I mean, I don't care how brilliant a cross-examiner you are, but the idea that you're going to win cases with the other side's witnesses, for yeah. example, mm -hmm. yeah. it's really, you know, it's not a good strategy. And they, of course, they're not really allowed to spend the time to do a good job. But, you know, you need to bring in witnesses, you need to bring in expert witnesses, you need to hopefully bring in fact witnesses, uh, let's say the person's not dangerous, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and they just don't do it. Um, it's costly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. hmm? Isn't it costly? Like, yeah, well, of course. I mean, it's all inconvenient to uh, actually enforce people's rights. When, yeah. when, <laughs> I mean, it's not, I mean, these legal proceedings are not really about enforcing people's rights. They're about checking a box that says right. we have, you know, we, you know, we had a trial, we had a fair trial. Okay, even though it, it wasn't a fair trial. And it results in the courts just accepting that psychiatrists don't give truthful testimony, and what's that called? Perjury. Um, and the judges accept it, the lawyers don't challenge it, and you know, everybody gets locked up and drugged or electroshocked. Okay, um, so then are people really entitled to effective representation? Okay, under the Constitution? Okay, there's a bad case in Washington which has adopted the, the criminal standard which is, which is the U.S. Supreme Court did in Strickland, which presumes that the representation was effective. And so they said judicial scrutiny of counsel's performance must be highly deferential. And you just have to assume that there are strategic decisions for whatever they did. And, they, and that you also must show that the reasonable probability that if the lawyer had been, done something different, the person would have won or the results would have been different. So that's really hard to prove. Now there's a good case in Montana called KGF, which rejected Strickland for, um, for mental health commitments and forced drugging. Um, rejected the presumption of effectiveness, said the lawyer has to try to achieve what the client wants. And that's a confusion that some lawyers have. I mean, I, mean, I think it's a violation of their uh, professional ethics, which I'll get into. They have to have specialized training, they have to do a thorough investigation. They have the right to be at the psych evaluation and a lot of other things. Sounds really good. It's totally ignored in practice. I mean, if you go to our website and go to Montana, there's this whole thing. I actually, I ended up, we ended up advocating for a patient in a Montana hospital. And then I got accused of the unauthorized practice of law. And I, and I wrote to the Supreme Court. Um, but one of the things was the, I forget what it's called, but the agency that hires a lawyer says, well, we, what are they called? Oh, we believe in rational representation. I mean, they literally said, and then said, come look at the Treatment Advocacy Center, okay, which is the big advocate for, uh, you know, for forced tr drugging and electroshock and locking people up. And basically, the, it's a formal policy of if this person wasn't crazy, she'd know it was uh, good for her, and therefore we're not going to follow their rights. Okay. Well, KGF, it says, reasonable professional assistance cannot be presumed in a proceeding that routinely accepts and even requires an unreasonably <coughs> low standard of legal assistance and generally disdains zealous adversary con confrontation. Okay. So that was really good. Um, but again, the they ignored it, and I wrote to the, to the Chief Justice, and she basically said, well, I, you know, which I knew she would, um, well, I you know, can't do anything outside of the court case. Now, in Alaska, we tried to raise this issue in the Weatherhorn case, where we won on this gravely disabled, and they said we couldn't, we had to bring it, we couldn't challenge it directly, because um, we need, you know, because you didn't have any explanation of why the Lord didn't do anything for her. You know, well, maybe there was a good reason why the lawyer didn't do anything for her. You know, I mean, I, so other states allow it. Other states allow direct challenges to representation, but not Alaska. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that it's not going to help anybody. Um, because appeals take a long time. I mean, well, maybe in Alaska people aren't locked up very long. You, most people aren't. And I guess that's maybe less true in other places. But... Um, it's not really a remedy for that person very much uh, to say, well, you shouldn't have been locked up, you know, two years ago when you, you know, when you first filed this appeal. Um, but I do, I do think that it's a violation of lawyers' professional responsibility. It's an ethical violation for them uh, when they don't vigorously defend their clients. 
Um, they have to be loyal to the client. Um, they have to achieve the client's wishes, you know, just like KGF said. Um, okay. So <laughs>